the human experience. Inside the humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Does this, this thing is working? This mic? Good, you can hear me. Um, I guess um, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges, or specifically about our history department and what we try to do with our students, and then link that up to the broader sort of economic and political challenges. Um, we have at Cal State Long Beach uh, about uh, 500 some odd majors, another 250 pre-credential pre or credential um, students, about 70 master's students, and roughly, I think, 25 tenure, tenure track faculty. So we've got a pretty big department. Um, and our department is uh, justified primarily by a requirement in the state of California that they take uh, American history. So it's the Americanists, not people like me, um, that justify the department. So I have to be thankful to my American colleagues for uh, the two American courses, 172 and 173, uh, which all students at Cal State Long Beach have to take. Um, what we have done in the history department is that uh, we've dealt with uh, the biggest challenge we have to deal with is assessment. We get constant pressures to figure out how to assess what our students learn. We have to integrate that uh, in all sorts of ways into our syllabi uh, with all sorts of course learning outcomes and objectives and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, what's really challenging is figuring out how to assess this thing called critical thinking, which IHUM was all about, analyzing text, critical thinking. Um, and this was the big challenge for us. So what we did, um, I guess it was before I came to Cal State Long Beach, it had been in operation for a couple of years, uh, is that we set up a system in the history major whereby students would take um, three core courses, 301, 302, and 499. So in, Early history majors take 301 and 302. 301 is how do you do a research paper, how do you analyze sources, uh, a basic methodology of being an historian. 302 is theory, um, and we go really heavy on the theory. And 499 is the capstone course. They do a large research paper, 25 pages typically, using original primary sources as well as secondary sources. And, um, one interesting component in all this is that 301, where they do the baby research paper, right? And 499, the capstone course, where they do the big research paper. In that course, they also have to do a portfolio. And the portfolio uh, talks about uh, their own development and growth as uh, historians who learn how to do critical thinking, to analyze sources. And then it provides proof of mastery of uh, uh, critical thinking through various things that they've done throughout their career at the university as a history major. So this becomes when someone knocks on the door of the department chair and says, tell us how you assess whether or not your students learn critical thinking, can do it. Uh, we point to a big stack of portfolios uh, that they produce for 301 and 499. Um, as a result of this, we, we've been written up in the AHA, American Historical Association Perspectives, for this system. Other uh, universities have begun to um, ask us quite a bit of how, about how we've implemented it and how it works. Uh, but it seems to be working in the sense that um, it answers the question that so many people outside our field have is, how do you assess what your students learn? How do you assess their mastery of critical thinking? Um, but I also think it's a good thing to do. I think it works. It's great for students. To, I mean, we when we go up for tenure, we've got to create a, a, a huge narrative that talks about all the great things we've done, how we've developed in our careers. Um, so, you know, we do the portfolio as well all the time. And I think it's a very useful exercise for the students to do that. Plus, it's the sort of thing that they're going to have to do when they get into the so-called real world and try to get a job. These uh, episodes of self-reflection. Okay. Um, when I got to Cal State Long Beach, I was at another school. Um, which had a similar kind of thing, but without the portfolio, and it wasn't as rigorous. I was amazed at how Cal State Long Beach expects its students to uh, read very difficult text and to do uh, original research. I thought, it's impossible. You can't possibly take the kinds of students that we have at Cal State Long Beach and expect them to be able to do this. 
at the previous institution where I was teaching, um, everyone had dumbed it down. Particularly after coming out of IHOM and dealing with Stanford students, which they're so easy to deal with, really, compared to the students that at least I have at Cal State Long Beach. Um, it, it was a shock. It was a shock. But what we've done at the Cal State Long Beach, I think, is we've maintained these high standards and we've imposed a sort of discipline on all the people that teach these core courses um, to really follow through and not give in to this tendency to dumb it down, to reduce the reading list, to reduce the expectations for papers, and so forth and so on. All right. That said, um, the challenges. The challenges stem both from the economics, that, you know, the economic reality of our situation today uh, in California, but also throughout the country, uh, and also just the kinds of students we have at Cal State Long Beach, very similar, I imagine, to San Jose State and all the other 23 campuses of the Cal State system. Um, ours is the largest campus in the Cal State system. We've got nearly 40,000 students. Um, we have, we are called a minority majority campus. So minorities are a majority on the campus. Many of them are first generation students. Um, they don't grow up in families where reading is something that is habitual. They don't have conversations around the dinner table as I did when I was growing up uh, about the affairs of the world and books that we had read. Those are just not things that they do. They're not things that they do. Um, they don't do much writing anymore uh, in high school and certainly not the kind of writing that I expect of them, being able to uh, craft an argumentative essay using evidence, all the sorts of things that we tried to teach people to do in IHUM. Um, then we've got the budget situation. Our budget has been cut 20%. Uh, so 20% of our budget is cut. Uh, um, so our budget is 20% less than last year. And last year's budget was, I think, about 20% less, less than the year before. So to give you a sense of what that means day to day, there is no paper anymore. I can't uh, print out paper syllabi. I have no copy budget. Uh, for exams, I can't print out exams. The students get the exams right before the exams. I send it out to them, uh, attach it to an email to all the students. They print it out, and then they come to class with the exam. Uh, so that's the situation that we have at Cal. I have zero copy budget for my own research or teaching purposes. I, no copy budget, none at all. Um, and you know the classrooms are falling apart. The technology doesn't work. If, it, if it's broken, it doesn't get fixed, and so forth and so on. So these are the kinds of irritating daily realities that we have to deal with. Um, in addition, the students are hurting. Because not only are they getting much uh, less quality of uh, the infrastructure is decaying, uh, the class sizes are going up, uh, but they have to pay more for it. They have to pay more for it. And as a result, uh, they have to work more. In many cases, 20 to 40 hours. Most of my students work at least 20 hours a week at some job, flipping burgers or whatever. whatever. Um, and many of them work full time. Some of them are married and have kids. Um, so there are all these challenges, and that means they have less time to devote toward uh, the classwork, to do the readings. So maintaining these high expectations given this economic climate is extremely, extremely difficult, and it's getting worse, and it ain't going to get better anytime soon, anytime soon. Next year is going to be worse than this year in the CSU system. That's what everyone keeps telling us. And then they're saying, get used to the way it is now. This is the new normal. This is the new normal. It's never going to go back to the halcyon days of 2006. <laughs> um, so I got a sense of that I taught 301, which is the sort of the first time students get a chance to do research uh, for the first time last year. Up, one of the problems with our core courses is that uh, we couldn't get any of the tenure and tenure track faculty to teach them. We gave them all to lecturers. But now that they've fired most of the lecturers, <laughs> we have no choice but to have to teach these things, which is a good thing. It is as it should be. It's one of the reasons I think that the system's beginning to work a little bit better now. Um, not that lecturers are not competent, but it's just that um, all the tenure track people should be involved in all the core courses, which are, after all, the foundation of the major, the history department major. Um, so I taught 301. I had 15 students. Of those 15, seven dropped. 
They just couldn't do it. They would have failed if they had continued taking it. That's typical. It's typical. We cap these at 15, and we usually get that kind of attrition rate. Of the, um, so seven dropped, of the eight who remained, it was a constant struggle, correcting papers, remedial work, basic grammar stuff. I couldn't really focus on the content of their papers because of these remedial issues. It was such a challenge. Um, I do a little exercise where I ask the students to talk about you know, what they remember from 10 years ago, something they did 10 years ago, something from a year ago, and then something from yesterday. And the stories blew me away. The hardships, the challenges these students face. In that one particular class, I had um, a very bright woman from, um, from Mexico. She came to the United States when she was 11 years old, did not speak a lick of English until she came to the United States. Uh, incredibly ambitious. Uh, very outgoing, very well spoken, but her writing is atrocious, absolutely atrocious, uh, really a, almost impossible to read. Um, so that was one student. Another student uh, uh, covered with tattoos and earrings and nose rings and all that kind of stuff. Um, he was um, brought up in foster homes. Uh, his parents had died when he was young. His brother, who took care of him, was murdered. Uh, he went to community college and despite everything, managed to uh, get out of community college and transfer into Cal State Long Beach, which for him was a dream come true. Uh, and um, again, so many remedial issues. The writing was just atrocious. Lots of interesting ideas, but the complete inability to express those ideas in any coherent way on a piece of paper. Much less figure out how to analyze evidence and put together an argument and support it and all that kind of stuff. Um, another student uh, from Vietnam, first generation um, um, college student, she uh, had lymphoma and uh, went through chemotherapy, had a heart attack, and nearly died uh, two years previously. Now she had gone through those first rounds, those rounds of chemo, and the, the lymphoma is in remission. She's back in my class. And um, as you can appreciate, the chemo uh, seriously degraded her ability to concentrate for long periods of time. And to be able to do the sorts of things you have to do to put together um, a paper, make an argument, collect evidence, um, and so on and so forth. It's just these are the kinds of realities. These are the students that I have to deal with. And yet we have these very, very uh, high expectations. Um, the other challenge associated with this, uh, with the writing issue, is that we are not well serviced, not to condemn the people who do English in the audience here, but um, we are not well serviced by uh, the English composition courses that are supposed to teach people how to do uh, writing. They don't really focus on the genre of writing that we expect within the history department. Um, what they focus on instead is having students pass something called the, the whoopee. The whoopee. Any, do any of you know the whoopee? Whoopee, yeah. Um, writing proficiency exam. But we just use the shorthand, whoopee. That's what we call it. Every student at Cal State Long Beach has to pass the whoopee in order to graduate. It's a basic, so it displays a basic proficiency in writing. It's a time 75 minute writing exercise. And so what the English classes do, the English 101 classes, is they basically teach kids how to pass the whoopee. Not how to write the kinds of papers that we expect in history, but how to pass the whoopee. And if you go to the writing resource center, that's what they're geared toward as well. So I send students to that writing resource center and they learn how to pass the whoopee, but they don't learn anything about how to write the kinds of papers that I expect. So this is a huge challenge. What we did, miraculously, I don't know how my chair managed this. This year she put into, um, she managed to find money to create a new system of five TAs, um, who are, not TAs, but uh, writing tutors, who were chosen from among our best master's students. And they have office hours uh, every week uh, and they provide writing assistance specifically for history majors, and only for history majors. And by the way, what started happening is that the writing center began sending people to our classes and saying that they were asked to come to our classes and talk about what the writing center will do for those students. So they got wind of this program, uh, and they're probably they're going to try to kill it. They're going to try to kill it. Uh, at any rate, we just started this. And so there are three things that these students do in this, uh, when they go to one of these tutors. We have a thesis writing 
exercise. There's a worksheet associated with this. So all students who write their history papers have to go and uh, go through this worksheet and then bring it back to me or any other person in the history department and show that yeah, I went through this history thesis writing workshop. The other thing that they have to do is then have these tutors read the rough drafts and then there's a worksheet on how you uh, assess these rough drafts and all the problems and so forth and so on. And then there's a final worksheet and exercise, spit and polish, after you do the, uh, you know, when you're writing the final draft. So that's the system we've set up. Um, I don't know how it's going to work, uh, but I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, one last thing. I don't want to go on too long here. Um, there was an interesting article in the um, and maybe we can talk about this. I don't know the answer. Why is it that students, um, their writing skills have declined? There are a lot of different explanations for that. I'd like to hear your view on that. Uh, but there's clear evidence that that's happening. I have, a, I have a sense of that just in thinking about students writing over the past 10 years or so that I've been in the classroom. Um, but even if you look at uh, scores on SATs, this was in the New York Times yesterday, I believe. Um, and it says that the uh, average scores in the SAT fell across the nation this year, with the reading score for the high school class of 2011 falling three points to 497, the lowest on record. So they're not reading, no surprise, right? Um, and uh, so it's fallen to the lowest on record. The average writing score dropped two points to 489. Um, scores, and you know the SAT now has a new component, not just the way we used to do it but they have a writing component to it as well. Since that was introduced six years ago, every single year the scores and the writing component have gone down. Every single year since that, part of the, that new part of the SAT uh, was introduced. Some guy named Robert Schaefer, public education director, something called Fair Test, a nonprofit political group, he says he blames it on standardized testing, no child left behind. I don't know. I don't, maybe that's the answer, maybe not. Perhaps we can have a discussion on that particular issue. At any rate, thank you for your time. All right, well, I'm going to be um, expanding or really drawing on a lot of the issues that Andrew has already raised. Um, as you can see here, my, my focus is on making humanities relevant to first generation college students. And I just want to make sure we're on the same page because that's a term that I wasn't particularly familiar with until relatively uh, recently, until really coming to San Jose State. Um, that you know, first generation means the first generation of their families to attend a four-year university. And it's ironic because I myself was a first generation student without even knowing that I was. Um, and my comments are going to be about Mexican American students in particular, although a lot of what I say I think applies more broadly to first generation students of any um, ethnicity. And I'm going to be sharing some facts and figures today. Sometimes these facts and figures are rel particular to Chicano or Mexican American. Uh, students, sometimes they apply to Latino students more broadly. Um, so I'm from the humanities, and I like to play fast and loose with numbers because I'm a literary person, <laughs> so uh, you have to bear with me. <laughs> okay, so I arrived uh, at San Jose State fresh from teaching three years of IHUM, where we have our 15 students per section, and um, it was an experience, a teaching experience that was very close to my own educational upbringing. Uh, I was an undergrad at University of Chicago, where my classes were all pretty much that size. Uh, and then I did my PhD here at Stanford, and of course, you know, graduate courses are very small. So uh, all of a sudden, I find myself at a large state school uh, teaching. One of my teaching assignments was a Mexican-American history course. It's a year-long um, general education, team-taught um, course. In the fall, we go from Aztec times to the Civil War. So it's only like 10,000 years of history in 16 weeks. Um, and in the first year I taught it, it had um, an enrollment upwards of 80 students. Um, some sections enrolled uh, 100 or more at a time. So I faced two particular challenges. Number one, how am I going to learn any of these students' names uh, when I am looking out at the sea of faces? And two, how can I make this class feel smaller, more intimate, um, help my students know that I notice when they're there or not, because um, even with that many students, um, you do. So I took one of my favorite uh, first day of IHUM activities, which was speed dating, uh, where you have students uh, go around and ask each other questions about each other, and they always loved it. And so I uh, 
these are the kind of questions I typically asked in IHUM. You know, how did you spend your summer break? Have you read any of the texts before in this class? What's your favorite movie, your favorite book? Any hobbies, extracurricular activities to get them chatting with each other? And I thought, okay, this is gonna be a mess with 70 students, I'm not actually <laughs> gonna do speed dating, but I turned it into an info questionnaire um, that each student had to fill out and send back to me. So at least if they came into office hours, I had something in front of me to ask them particular questions about their lives. All right, but once class began in earnest though, when I really started getting to know my students, I realized that those questions that I was so proud of on my questionnaire really told me nothing that I actually needed to know about what it was gonna be like to work with them and to really help them make the most of um, their potential. Um, so here are some general um, realities of stu uh, Latino students broadly in, in my uh, Mexican American history course. So typically 90% of them are the first in their families to attend uh, a four-year um, university. At least 67% on average work uh, at least part-time. 35% uh, I think that's what I wrote there, um, work full-time. And again, these aren't jobs, you know, some of my Stanford students worked, uh, but in a lab and helping a professor with research. And you know, these are students who work at Lowe's, at BB, in the mall, um, so not jobs that are helping them develop their uh, intellectual interests. Um, a full 20% of the students in my class are classified as being in remedial status, either in English or in math uh, and or both. And uh, I soon came to appreciate that these are students who had overcome tremendous odds uh, even to get to San Jose State. And so I wanna share with you, um, these are some facts and figures from 2000. They're scholars who are working on refining them and updating these figures. But this is called the Chicano Educational Pipeline. So what it tells us is that for every 100 Mexican-American students who start off uh, in kindergarten, only 46 uh, end up graduating from high school. Of those 46, uh, just about half, 26, end up enrolling uh, in college. The vast majority of them get funneled into community college. Uh, nine go on to a four-year, but look at that jump. 17 who go to a community college, only one will end up transferring to a four-year. That's a huge drop-off right there. So we end up with eight out of that original 100 who are able to earn uh, a bachelor's degree. Uh, and I think that's within um, maybe six years or maybe even you know, ever. And from there, 2% go on to professional degrees and only 0.2 uh, go on to a PhD or end up earning that kind of degree. Um, so, I wanna talk for a minute about reasons why some factors playing into this, and I want to dispel from anyone's mind uh, any blame on uh, cultural deficiency. This is often something people turn to. Uh, we had the, one of the deans at San Jose State uh, famously made a comment that um, Latino and black students, in his view, didn't do as well as Asians and whites because their parents simply don't care about education. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very popular idea that, uh, that a lot of people have um, but really there's uh, three other things I really want to emphasize as contributing factors to these kind of dismal numbers. The first, um, as Andrew mentioned, right, is that their K through 12 education simply has not prepared them um, for the rigors of college. A second thing is that oftentimes these are students who have internalized the very negative messages that they've received about their potential from uh, administrators and teachers over the years, you know, people who tell them that they can't be successful. Uh, it's very hard to overcome uh, those messages when these are adults who are in control of your life, are supposed to be in positions of authority over you, uh, giving you these messages. And then a third thing is that they often have very few opportunities in the classroom to draw upon uh, this, what we call cultural capital, um, the many skills that they have, um, such as Navigational capital, right? This is the ability to deal with institutions. Um, oftentimes, for example, um, say if a student has a, a primarily Spanish-speaking parent, they often have to translate from a young age for that parent at the bank, uh, with the schools and teachers and whatnot. And that's a real strength, right? But it's often seen as, well, that's something that you lack or you don't have this skill, right? Um, and again, many people are very resistant to this idea. Uh, I, a, another woman in a kind of assessment workshop I was at uh, just in the spring said, I was trying to raise this point about cultural capital, uh, and she said, well, that's because black and Latino students, they have street smarts, not school smarts. Hmm. 
You know, and so all these wonderful strengths that they bring to our classrooms get relegated as skills that are really just only belong in the street. And it's very different from the highfalutin intellectual uh, things that we do in the classroom. Right? But they're, they're very intertwined. So anyway, the, um, the results of this, um, part of the results of this pipeline, right, is that um, uh, nationwide, only 6% of Latinos um, major in humanities disciplines. Right? And this is because they feel a lot of pressure to not waste their parents, and in fact their own, since they pay for their own educations largely, uh, time and money. Uh, there's also the issue of impaction. Right? They often simply cannot get into the classes they need uh, to keep making progress towards the degree. Uh, there's an additional pressure to major in something practical. Right? And so at San Jose State, I found that this is typically business, criminal justice, uh, kinesiology, nursing. It's seen the purpose of college primarily to get a job, but a focus on the job itself rather than the critical thinking or communication skills that make one a strong applicant for any kind of um, you know, starting level position. Um, I don't want to go to that yet. Um, I thought there was something else I wanted to say here. Um, so that's uh, some of these res results. Okay, get my lost my train of thought all of a sudden. Okay, so I'm asking what can be done. Uh, normally I like to reveal my points one by one, so just uh, follow along with me. <laughs> That's like trying to get 80 students to not write down the whole slide. Uh, okay, so I don't uh, have all the answers, um, but two things to start. Like one is simply getting to know your students better. Uh, so I changed these like little questions I put on, the, on, on my first day questionnaire. So one of them, uh, some of these now include, for example, you know, do you work part, full or part-time? How many hours per week? Uh, did either of your parents attend college? Uh, what is something you're most proud to have accomplished? And I really love reading their answers. Um, for the vast majority of them, their proudest accomplishment is merely getting into a four-year university. That's something that they never, uh, that they, their families, their teachers never thought they would ever accomplish. That's the, probably the, by far and away the, the number one answer. Um, and two, showing them how humanities text and disciplinary approaches are relevant um, to their lives. So there's a couple other things I want to say here. Um, I think it's really easy to assume about these kinds of students that they just don't care. Um, so I'll share a story about a student of mine named Luis who uh, was desperate to get into um, the second semester of my history class. He wanted to wrap up this GE. Uh, and uh, he came to my office hours to ask for an ad code, and that impressed me because most students don't even bother to do that. And he, you know, was on his knees. I'm going to do my best work. I'm going to dedicate myself to the class. So I said, okay, you can have an ad code. And then I was very dismayed to find over the next couple of weeks that he uh, had his head down in class, often appeared to be asleep. Uh, and so, you know, I'm singling him out because it's like, oh, you came uh, to ask me for the code, and I gave it to you, and now I, I don't even see you putting in the work. I started getting very annoyed with him. And he ended up coming uh, back to my office hours to apologize and to explain to me that he had a newborn child. Mm -hmm. uh, he's only 19. Uh, he goes to school full time, uh, works, watches the baby all night long, and then um, the baby's mother, uh, meanwhile, is working a night shift and then with the baby during the day. And then my heart goes out to him because I can only imagine what it's like to juggle all these things at such a young age. Um, but without knowing that about him, it would just it's easy to say, like this dean, like they just don't care. It's not that they don't care, it's all these other financial uh, and real life pressures um, that they face. And I think that, I'm not saying that Stanford students or students you know, at these kinds of schools don't face similar challenges and haven't overcome just as much, but oftentimes that's, I think, much more hidden, at least from what I've observed. They're better at being students uh, than um, some of my San Jose students are. And then uh, a note about the relevancy. Uh, it's just really exciting to me that once I get them interested in history, uh, oftentimes, I, mean, I was telling Jenny the other day that one of my, uh, some of the things that make me happy is to see in my student evaluations comments like, oh, I never used to like history before, but this was my favorite class, and you know, I, I, I love coming to class every day. Right? They just don't know that they could be interested in humanities topics, right? So once I get them interested in history, then they're oftentimes more likely to take my Chicano literature class, and then they're simply blown away to discover 
literature written by Mexican Americans talking about things they can really relate to, stories that they feel are so close to their own. So it's, you know, I don't know, there's potential for a lot of new, new doorways to draw them in, but it's just hard when um, we're in this economic climate where it's just limited time, limited money, I need to get this degree to get a job rather than to be uh, critically thinking and, and, and how these skills can apply to any kind of position. So thank you.